God is faithful. We thank him for taking us through the last, uh, well, day and a piece. And we would trust him. We would trust him every step of the way. Remember, brethren, he has been here before. We just arrived, we're trying to do. But he has the full picture. Been here throughout. From everlasting to everlasting, he is God. And we acknowledge this this morning. Father, we thank you. As we continue, Lord, in our sharing, our eyes upon you. We know that you receive our worship this morning. We know you heard our prayers this morning. We know, God, that you are pleased. You are taking action. You wanted us to sing. You wanted us to bless you. You wanted us to talk to you and to cry out before you. And God, we trust you now as we come to your word, that you will speak to us as you have done before. Our eyes now upon you in Christ's name. Amen. So we continue sharing on what we began on Holy As Night, New Year's Day. Revelation is the seed for relationship, part two. Revelation is the seed for relationship, part two. And our text, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, which is the Amplified Version, the second part of verse 12, for I know, for I know him, and I am personally acquainted with him, whom I have believed with absolute trust and confidence in him and in the truth of his deity. And I am persuaded beyond any doubt that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted to him until that day when I stand before him. Amen. I just wanted to make the, the emphasis here, we wanted to place it on Paul's statement, I know whom I have believed. Often we can, if we are speaking sometimes, we can tell you or say, I know what I believe. That is not Paul's emphasis here. It's not the what. It is the who. The who came from the what. But the who is so important for declaring in the atmosphere and to the world. And here it is. This is the takeaway I want us to, to, to hold on to and to live today in this series. I call it a series. I don't know yet. All right? But here is the takeaway from this sermon. You know the farmer. When the farmer <clears throat> lays his hand on good seed, the farmer becomes excited. And the farmer goes home to his land to sow that seed. That seed will produce a good crop. That's his expectation. But as he receives seed, what he thinks about is his land, his garden. Why? Because the farmer has a relationship with his land. The farmer has a relationship with his land. And so when he receives seed, he thinks about his land and he sows it in his land. And he goes every day to look at the land and to look at the seed because it is his delight. In like manner, brethren, the take home is this. Whenever you receive revelation, whenever the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and reveals truth, brings light to the Word of God, it is seed, the Word of God is seed. And seed comes to us, is exposed by the Spirit in revelation. What we must do, like the farmer, sow it, it back to the Lord. As the land is to the farmer, the Lord is to us. He has a relationship with his land. We have a relationship with God. And when we pray God's word back to him, when we speak God's word, as we heard in prayer this morning, back to God, that is where the relationship blossoms. Amen? So don't be too excited only 
by receiving revelation or seed. Be excited that you have a relationship with God that you can sow that seed, that revelation into the relationship with God. Remember that God is both the subject and the object. So the revelation is about him. The relationship is with him. And so, Lord, I thank you. That is so a good, a good word I received this morning devotion. I pray it back to you. I'm sowing it back to you. I'm claiming that. And I'm looking like the farmer looks at this land to see it blossom, see cultivation and growth and harvest. Lord, I thank you that I have the privilege to have a relationship with you. So revelation and relationship go hand in hand. Reading the story, Dr. Russell Moore, M-O-O-R-E, he, he um, wrote in his book, Adoption for Life. He described a scene he encountered at an orphan home in Russia. He went to the home and saw in the nursery silence. It was filled with babies, but they were all quiet. And he wondered how come these babies are so quiet. Later on, he discovered that the babies used to be crying. The nursery was the, a very loud and noisy place. But the babies stopped crying. Not that their need, they, don't have, they didn't have needs to be met, but they recognized that no one was taking them on. And so they stopped crying. And he was so perplexed by it, he wrote it in his book, Adoption for Life, ensuring that sometimes we believers act this way. Because we don't know a fresh and daily ongoing relationship with God. We believe that God is silent. We believe he's not hearing us. We believe that he does not care, and so we stop worshiping. We stop praying. We stop rejoicing. We stop talking about him. We stop relationship. We stop life. But that is Satan's ploy and trick. God said in his word, it's Isaiah 50, I think, can a mother forget her suckling child, a nursing child? He said, even if she does, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will always remember you because God is a God of relationship. From inception, from creation, we see God created man and God sought a relationship with Adam and Eve. Every day God would come in the evening, the cool of the day, to do what? To talk, to chat with Adam. God is a relationship God. And he wants us to know we don't have to be like the children in that nursery, quiet, thinking God does not care. He loves us and he cares about us. Don't hold your silence. Cry out to him. Believers who are confident in their relationship with God, they cry. They lament. They worship. They call upon God because they know that he is hearing. He is a relationship God. Remember in part one, I told you um, that's one of the lessons I learned from my wife, the difference between revelation and relationship. The former speaks of the grace and beauty of the promises of God, the seed, the sperma of God. The latter, that is revelation, sorry, relationship, considers the amazing love and beauty of God himself. God himself. So as we continue, in our sharing, understand that once we are receiving truth, once the Spirit of God is unveiling the word to us, and revelation is coming to us, we are to nurture it in relationship. It's all well and good to say, Pastor, that was a good word. In fact, you don't really say that anyway, so 
Let me say to yourself, let me say to yourself, don't keep it there. If you had a devotion this morning and said, wow, Father, I, I, you're praying because, Lord, this really, really struck me. Don't keep it there. Put it, invest it in him, in relationship. One goes with the other. It's like the two sides of a coin. They are connected. It's a very dangerous thing to just be receiving revelation via devotions, by a, a book reading, by a, your Bible reading the scripture, by a sermons, conversations. It's a dangerous thing to just be receiving revelation and doing nothing about it. Just keeping revelation on the inside and not sowing it in relationship back to God identify two serious conditions that could develop. One, I mentioned last time, you can become prideful. You can become prideful and indifferent. The old sages say, you become hardened to the word. You can hear 50 sermons in one week, it doesn't matter because you're hardened to it. You become indifferent. It's, it's, it's not impacting you become unresponsive. The second condition that could develop, that you, become, you can become spiritually sick, even with the word. You can become spiritually sick. That is a good example. Well, I'm not sure it's a good example. The Dead Sea. Nothing really can live in the Dead Sea, really. It's just as a, it's a certain type of bacteria that can exist in it. Fish can't go there, they can't live. The Dead Sea has inlets, but no outlets. It's very low, the lowest part of the earth, I think. It's nothing to roll out. So the only way water leaves the Dead Sea is by evaporation. That's the next sermon, incidentally, yeah? that's the next sermon. The only way water leaves the Dead Sea is by evaporation. There is no outlet. In our context, we can say it is sick. Um, I, I saw something on um, a program on TV, what it was. It was showing this sign, this, this is a beauty shop. They said what? It was life products from the Dead Sea. Life products from the Dead Sea. Almost uh, it's, a, it's, it's a paradox, I know. But it could be, just because the scribe says, if we become the Dead Sea on the inside, and all of us together, Dead Sea people, what life products can come from us? The only time something can happen is if something massive happened, because there is no relationship. That is not God's plan for you. Be careful, you can become spiritually sick if you are not pursuing and investing revelation in relationship to God, you become suff suffocated. Suffocated in terms of you're inhaling, <laughs> you're not exhaling. You can try it if you want to. You have to exhale. And that is the investing. In John chapter 6, Jesus told um, the people, the multitude that was following him. He said, you're following me for food, miracle food. You are not following me for relationship. You really don't want to know me as your savior and Lord. And an interesting conversation occurred between Jesus and the people. And you can read it. It's, some, it's chapter 6 of John from verse 25. I have a couple of verses I want to read. They couldn't find him. He fed them. The five loaves and two fishes. And then he went for the disciples on the other side of the sea. And then they found him on the west side of the lake, sorry, and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you for certain that you're not looking for me because it's, you're not looking for me because you saw the miracles, but because you ate all the food you wanted. 
that what you're looking for. You're on a mundane level. So don't work for food that spoils. Work for food that gives eternal life. The Son of Man will give you this food because God the Father has given him all the right to do so. What exactly does God want us to do? The people ask. Jesus answered, God wants you to have faith in the one he sends. They reply, what miracle will you work so that we can have faith in you? Just, they had just had food. They just ate food. Now, in that same chapter, incidentally, now they ask him, what miracle will you work so that we can have faith in you? What will you do? For example, when our ancestors were in the desert, they were given manna to eat. It happened just as the scripture says. God gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then told them, I tell you for certain that Moses wasn't the one who gave you bread from heaven. My father is the one who gives you the true bread from heaven. And the bread that God gives is the one who came, referring to himself, the one who came down from heaven to give life to the world. The people said, Lord, give us this bread and don't ever stop. Jesus replied, I am the bread that gives life. Then the people, verse 41, the people started grumbling because Jesus had said he was the bread that had come down from heaven. They wanted physical bread. They wanted to eat. And now you're saying that you are the bread? You play with our minds. We want food. Show us a miracle with more food. And don't stop giving us food. Just like the man in past times. Give us revelation. More and more revelation. But we want no relationship with you. And that's what people said. That's what Jesus said, sorry, to the people. And he said, Who eat, if, you eat, if you eat of me, shall have life. In fact, in that ch chapter, they, be, they grumbled and they left because they were not pleased with the way the conversation turned. Christ turned that conversation to relationship, but they wanted to just stay in the place of, we want more and more and more to eat. More and more to eat. And of course, I'm sure you can apply and see the spiritual context of this conversation. Brethren, God deeply desires an intimate relationship with you and with me. Why? Because God loves you. That's the governing factor. God loves you. He wants you to trust him. He wants your friendship. He wants your affection. Just as he began, he initiated it. He gave us his affection and all of the promises he made. Just train us. You can trust me. I will not forsake you as a mother may who is nursing a child. The essence of an intimate relationship is the experience of really knowing very knowing God. Of course, it's the same it's in the human relationship, human context. The essence of relationship in the human context is really knowing someone and being known by, that, by someone. If the, if, the, if the revelation is not there, the relationship can't be there. And this is what God is saying to us. It is feeling very close to the other person because they know you, they know you at a deep level, and you know that person also in a deep and personal level. All other relationship models are not relationships in the true sense. They are surface relationships. The whole English says superficial relationships, meaning surface. God does not want a superficial, a surface relationship with us. A farmer would not have a superficial surface relationship with his, his land. He loves his land. And the best will be sowed in that land because of that relationship that's so deep. He lives by it. If we live by God, if we live by communion with God, 
if we value the relationship we have with God, we will pursue. Every seed we receive, we will invest it right back to him. The seed came from him. He gives seed to the sower, the scripture says. So these, what I should say, good human relationships teach us much about God himself and the relationship we can have with him. The relationship he desires from us. So what enables you to love someone and to develop that true um, intimate relationship with them? Well, there are many factors, but one of them, a key factor, is trust. Trust. All of the, vari the, the, the variations inside there, that common denominator in all relationship is trust. You cannot have genuine, intimate relationship with someone who you don't trust. I think there's a movie, you know. A husband and wife. In fact, there is a relationship. But they both would sleep with guns below their pillow, I think, on the side. You, you said about girls. What's the name of that movie? Sorry? Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Mr. And Mrs. Smith. I know we could have... <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Smith. No relationship. Yeah, they, they are connected, but they will shoot each other. That's how we go with God. We read his word, but we don't believe his word. There is no trust. Trust is the heart of an intimate relationship. If we say that we are in a relationship with God, we are also saying, I trust God and trust him completely. Trust comes from knowing him, knowing him as a person. Trust comes from knowing that he is he's safe to be around. I feel safe in his presence. I can draw closer to him in relationship because he will do me well. He's a trustworthy, faithful God. When trust is not there, when trust is compromised, the degree of intimacy evaporates. So at one time, you were strong in faith, you were strong in your relationship with God. But when you feel that God disappointed you, or he didn't rescue you at a certain time, as someone said, don't let your faith be held hostage by some situation or some prayer outcome. God is trustworthy. And when we compromise trust, intimacy or relationship evaporates. I need to run because time. But understand the value of trust, the importance of trust. In fact, when there's a relationship, in fact, you can sit by someone, right next to someone, and you, 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 you feel distant. You could know the person. Anywhere in the office, some, some waiting room. But you could be far, away from someone. When there is relationship, you could be as far as 100 miles from someone and feel very close to them. And all the people say, and this is likened even to heaven. We are miles away from God who sits on his throne and we can feel very close to him. Why? Because of relationship. He is in heaven. We are on earth physically. But we can feel very close to God because there is relationship. That when we take the word of God, and we embrace it tightly and sow it back to him in relationship. There is a kaleidoscope of beauty and worship and praise and trust that takes over our lives. There's a common mistake we have, and that common mistake is to think that relationship with God can be achieved through an accumulation of revelation. That is not so. 
you can feed and feed and feed and feed. But until like the, the, the cow would, do, would, would begin to chew its cud, almost as it will invest in that food now into the, the digestive stomach, that cow would die. <laughs> and so too, as we accumulate, as we receive revelation, don't put it on a shelf. Invest it in God and see how that, how our connect with him, our close connection with him blossoms and takes us into a whole new space. Sometimes we feel God is hiding from us. Let me just close this because I don't know what to stop. Some we feel as though God is hiding from us. We play hide and seek and you can't, and there's somebody in that group who knows well how to hide, you can't find them. And you always wish that person could be in your team, not against you because you can't find them. Does somebody feel so about God? You feel that you're playing hide and seek with God and God is always hiding from us and we can't find him. When and should you feel that way? Just review and check your relationship. Something is evaporating. God will not hide from us. It's he who initiated. He who said, I, I love you, and I want to be in a relationship with you. Let's believe him. Let's pursue him. For you are